So to give you some background on this presentation is you, we spent a lot of time yesterday um, talking about what the product you're developing, what need you're addressing, and who the customers are. And then Shobit did some more work with you today on that this morning, right? But like you guys, a lot, you, most of you have a really great product, okay? But are you making money yet? A little bit, okay. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. So one of the big challenges after you figure out your value proposition and the product is how to make money, all right? And I think for those of you who come from a research background or a technology background, you're more focused, your, your general tendency is to focus on the product and the technology and not about making money. And um, you know, yesterday I was talking to a group, I think it was you guys, that when I was in business school, I was coming from an engineering background, I took really good notes, and for my fellow classmates, when I saw they weren't in class, I'd make a copy of the notes and hand it to them, right? A few years later, I'm listening to this guy who's with a startup that got funded for $100 million, and he's saying, well, I was always an entrepreneur. When I was at UCLA Business School, I used to take my notes from every class, and I would sell them to my classmates. <laughs> and I thought, damn, like, I gave him away, you know, I made a lot of friends, but he's a lot richer than me. So talking today is about business models and getting you guys now to be more in the mindset of also thinking about how you make money. Because if you don't make money, you won't survive as a company. And that wonderful creation, the wonderful value proposition you've developed isn't going to get to market. So let's talk about business models. And the main goal here isn't tell you how to do your business model, because each one is different, each customer is different. There's a lot of different options. But to get you into thinking about making money and being creative, the same way I should have sold my notes, right? <laughs> So business models. It's about how to make money, how to have a profitable business. And what we want to do is move from value proposition now to value extraction. How do you extract the business potential? And we talked about it yesterday with your heritage company, is you know, who's willing to pay? Where is the money? There's a lot of historical business models, and that's what comes to mind for most people. Things like, oh, we buy, we sell our product, we license it, we, you know, we do advertising. Those are the traditional models. But what's happening now is that there are more and more innovative ways of making money. And those are the ones that, in many cases, catches the investor's attention. Things, especially things that transform processes and, and identify totally new ways of making money. And we're going to talk about some of them in the next few slides. You know, with the digital world, with the internet, a lot more things have been enabled. The fact that you can go on your phone and call a car, call Uber. You know, those are things that weren't possible in the olden days. So we've ended up with companies like eBay, Spotify, SolarCity. All these were enabled by the internet. So, if you look at history, there's always been market trends in history. You see trends of what's happened. If you look right now, like in the 70s, there was specialization, 80s, there was built to order. And what's happened is that with these market trends, new business models have emerged and new companies. So if you look right here, with the specialization, you had like Toys R Us, you know, a store that did only toys, right? With built the just-in-time manufacturing, you had companies like Dell, where you order specifically the computer you want and was built for you. Uh, hey, 1990s, we all know, it was a crazy time of the internet, and you had airlines where you only buy the tickets online, like Ryanair and EasyJet. And now as we go into the 2000s, 
one of the biggest trends is Minecraft, <laughs> gaming, and gamification. And what we've seen is now more companies emerge and making tons of money on gamification and gaming. So, one of the most important things as you're developing your business model, okay, is make sure you identify who has the money, okay? You may develop a product which is great for this one user, but the question is, do they have the money? If they don't have the money, you're not going to, they just can't buy it even if they wanted to. So an example of this is, this is a special plant-based um, pesticide developed by a university in Taiwan. And this worm, what it did was it kept, it, it, sorry, uh, this pesticide kept worms from eating the tea leaves. You know, all those expensive tea leaves that are grown in Taiwan and sold. So the developers of this, they of course thought, we're going to sell it to the farmers, right? Because the farmers are the ones that want to save their crops so they can sell them and make money. But what they found out is the farmers had no money. They were, you know, they were making so little profit, they couldn't spend extra money on a special pesticide. So there was this great innovation, the ideal user, but no money. So what a waste, right? So what happened is, is the university took their product to a lot of conferences, and they found someone who had the money. And what they identified is the tea companies, like this box of tea costs about 100 euros. Okay, crazy, huh? But that's what people pay for nice tea. And they bought this organic pesticide, gave it to the farmers, bought the leaves from the farmers, packaged this tea as organic, and sold it for 200 euros. <laughs> so they're the ones that really know how to make money. So what was really innovative is, though they found the original person they thought would buy their product, couldn't afford it, they kept looking for someone who had the money and who could make some need or opportunity out of it. So think of things like this as you're working on your project. Who has the money and who benefits from your product? Okay, basic business math. So physics is kind of the basis for a lot of things we do in engineering, okay? This business math is the basics for what we do in business. And we talked about this yesterday. It's profits equals revenues minus costs. And anything that affects one of these variables is a part of the business model. So if you look at the different activities you can do to make money, to make profits, those are all elements of your business model. <coughs> business models are not easy. So you guys don't think that you're gonna, that, it's that you need to be able to figure something out, you know, in the next day or two, but you can start thinking about it, and then you'll probably be iterating and iterating. Like Isabel said yesterday, most investors, when they invest in a company, they want to see a business model. However, they expect that business model to change within a year in 90% of the cases. And what they really want to see is that your ability to understand what a business model is and develop one. And then when you test it in the market, like Shobit talked about this morning, when you go in the market and you validate it, it might be the wrong model, but you go develop another one. So, some business model challenges. Uh, how many of you remember this? 1998. Uh, how many of you were not born <laughs> in 1998? <laughs> this is the Google page, search page in 1998. And they launched it and it was free and millions of users used it. Great value proposition, okay? But still no way to make money. No way to make value extraction. So what happened as we talked about yesterday is in terms of empowerment, the Google founders did a challenge to the whole 
team, the whole Google company, come up with ideas how we can monetize our search. And one of the engineers invented Google AdWords. Okay? And now Google AdWords generates more than 50, 60% of Google's $66 billion annual revenue. So you may not have an obvious business model in the beginning, but a lot of companies don't, and then they evolve. If you look right here, LinkedIn, which is like an online business social media site, LinkedIn, initially, everyone thought lots of users, advertising, right? But LinkedIn, now 30% of their revenues is actually made by selling tools to recruiters or headhunters, people who are helping companies hire people. So they've kept evolving their business model and added new revenue streams. Another company, Twitter, how many are on Twitter? Not that many. Oh gosh, in the U.S., if you're not on Twitter, you're a nobody. <laughs> but it's different cultures, different countries. So in Twitter, everybody in the U.S. is on Twitter. But guess what? Twitter is losing money because they haven't figured out a business model. They have hundreds of millions of users, but they haven't figured out how to monetize it. And this year, they actually fired the CEO because he couldn't figure out a business model to make the company profitable. So business models actually can change over time. You may start out with a business model that makes sense, but then it needs to change over time. Like if you look at TomTom, Tom, right? You're in the Netherlands. What was its initial business model? To sell hardware, right? To sell those little personal navigation devices. But guess what's happened? Everyone already has a device on there. Smartphone, right? So their business model to sell hardware no longer works. So now they've evolved and they're now changing their business model to selling software and services. But one of the best examples of how business models change is that this printer. This is my very first printer. I bought it in 1992 when my uh, first son was born. <laughs> He's as old as my son. It was $2,000, OK? Has anyone here spent $2,000 on a printer? That was pretty foolish, huh? <laughs> but that's because back then, HP made money by selling hardware. Now, a printer costs less than $100 or 100 euros, right? So why is there such a big difference? Because how does HP make money now? Ink. They sell ink. They sell lots and lots of ink. and you know, in five years, I easily spend $2,000 on ink. So something to walk away with is the fact that recurring revenue, repeating revenue, where you continuously get revenue, is a much better business model than a one-time. So think about possibly how in your services, it can be a recurring revenue versus a one-time. Mm. And then another concept is nothing is really free. And you guys live in the internet world, right? It seems like everything is free. And the, most of the young people expect things to be free. But nothing's free. Somebody is paying for it. So I was in Maastricht for a conference, and I went out to dinner by myself. And I found this nice Greek restaurant. And I'm going, this is awesome. They have free Wi-Fi, right? But when I click and log into the network, it says you have to log in with Facebook. OK, whatever. I log in with Facebook. They still don't give me the internet. No, I have to like the restaurant before they'll give me the internet. Yeah, right. Well, you know what? You know how much a Facebook like is worth? It's worth $174 in um, advertising. So if a company spent $174 handing out flyers, that brings in the same number of customers as if I liked it and my friends saw it. So I basically gave the restaurant $174 of free advertising, right? 
So it wasn't free. It cost me my reputation to say this is a good restaurant. And personally, the dinner was only twenty dollars. I, they should have given me that for free. <laughs> okay. So there's money is made somehow, just not in the traditional ways. It's not the usual person buys now. They're making. <coughs> there's different ways to make money. So one super important concept, and I talked to some of you guys about it yesterday. As you're looking at your business, right? So on the mm, business model canvas, it talks about customers. Okay, but think a little bit deeper. Who is the customer? You know, some of you have said it's the person who buys it, but it's also the person who uses it. They're all customers, and you have to please all the customers relevant to your product. So these are pizza rolls. Do you sell them here in? Netherlands? No, I know you guys eat a lot healthier stuff than we do in the U.S. So, Tostinos are these pizza rolls that my son really likes. Okay, he's always like, "Mom, can you buy me some Tostinos, please, please?" Okay, and so I buy him Tostinos. He's a customer. He's the user. He's the one that eats these greasy, salty, gooey, yucky things, right? But. I'm the buyer. I'm the one that goes to the store and buys it, right? So Totino's has to appeal to both my son and myself. Look how big he got on Totino's. It's probably got a lot of hormones in it or something. <laughs> okay, but there's also another customer in this equation: is the partner. If the partner didn't carry Totino's. It doesn't matter if I wanted to buy it, and it doesn't matter if he wants to eat it. So think of the different roles of the customers that are relevant to your business. You know, is there a user? Is there a buyer? Are they different? And is there a partner required? Because for some of the businesses, you can't go directly to the buyer or user. You have to go through a channel. So you have to make sure that you know who all your customers are, and make sure you have a plan to reach them. If you have a plan to reach all the customers that are required for your business, then you have a much stronger business plan. Oh, another concept is make it easy to collect money. Okay, it's sort of like, hey, I want to sell something to you. I got some candy bars. I'm doing a fundraiser. You want to sell it to you? And what do you say? Oh, oh, well, I don't have any cash. Okay, then I can't sell it. It's okay. You got your phone. You can pay me via the internet. I'm not letting you get away with it. You're going to pay me somehow. So make it easy for your customers to pay. This doesn't like me anymore. So I just bought that computer, which you guys all know about. It's gone through a lot of adventures, but when I bought this on Dell, and I went to the payment page, this is what I saw. I could pay for my computer with a credit card. I could actually create a、um, credit account with Dell and actually pay a monthly installment, or I could pay with PayPal. Or I could pay with a gift card, or with Bitcoin, and that's what surprised me. Dell was going to get the money from me somehow, okay? And the fact that they will also let you pay with Bitcoin is shows that they can collect the money from you somehow. And that's so. As you work on some of your stuff, think about how to make it easy to collect money. One of the concepts for enterprise sales. Is people have spending limits? Okay, if you're a manager, your spending limit is five thousand euros. If you're a director, your spending limit is twenty-five thousand euros. If you're VP, your spending limit is fifty thousand, based on what your seniority is and your priority. So, if you're selling to someone, a director, and their spending level is twenty-five thousand euros, but your product is fifty thousand, he Or she has to go up to their boss to get approval. 
which adds another three months to your sales cycle, or you hit someone who goes, no, I don't like it, right? So one of the tricks that enterprise sales does is they go, oh, we'll sell it to you in installments of $25,000 every six months. Then the director can sign off for it without getting approval. So these are little concepts that make it easy for people to spend money. All right? Um, Another concept is about um, overcoming barriers to adoption. Like, if you have something that's super expensive and people don't have the money, the budget to do it, then much as they like it, they can't buy it. So here's an example about how um, one company came up with a new business model to overcome the barrier to adoption. So Wholesale Solar, they sell big solar installations for homes. The problem is, is that it's about $50,000 for an installation. And who has $50,000 sitting in the bank to invest in solar right now? None of you guys, because you're poor entrepreneurs. <laughs> so Solar City, what they did is, is they came up with a new business model to get people to adopt solar. So they had the buy option where you can spend $50,000. But they also had, came up with a lease option where Solar City bought the equipment, they owned the equipment and then they rented it or leased it to the homeowner. And so the homeowner didn't have to pay a big upfront fee. And the homeowner paid like a monthly lease price. But also that when in California, as compared to the Netherlands, there's a lot more sun. So a lot of times a house would generate more energy collecting sunlight and converting it to energy than it would use. So that could be sold back to the utility and sold back to you know, the energy company. And Solar City, since they own those panels, got to keep the revenues from selling it back. So they made money by renting the panels to the homeowner and made money from selling excess energy back to the utility. So do you see, they looked at new ways of making money versus the traditional sell a unit to a homeowner. So keep thinking about, like, what are new ways that your company can make money? And so this business model of how they collected revenue also addressed the barrier to adoption problem. And it got the revenue flow going. So very, very common business model, and you know, maybe you didn't realize it was actually a business model, is freemium. So this company, Accents, is a company that produces the, um, a whole suite of network tools for the computer. They offer their network monitoring tool for free. And so they have like 10,000 people using it for free. And those people really liked the product, thought it was really user-friendly, it really helped them. And so when Accents offered them their other products, People were like, yeah, I love it. I love your product, and I need these other solutions. So then they bought the whole suite of solutions, which costs like you know, $200 a month. And so what they did was use free as a model to get people captured as a customer and then upsold them. So I'm going to right now just talk about some business models that evolved because of trends in the market with the internet, and then also with the concept of there's a lot of excess resources that aren't being used. So um, who drove here? OK, what's your car doing <coughs> right now? Nothing. Your car's doing nothing right now. And how many people are out in Amsterdam walking in the rain wishing they had a car? 
<laughs> so, so this is the concept of collaborative consumption when there's excess resources, and that's what Airbnb did. Is this, there's a lot of rooms that people aren't using, or apartments that people aren't using, like there's the restaurant uh, hotel de Hautfaisant, right? If you, any of you have been there, well, the chef just moved in with his girlfriend in Wester Park, so he has an empty apartment. And it just sits there, and it's really nice. So he put it on Airbnb, and I rent it, and I stay there. And it's awesome, because he has all the perfect dishes and pans and spices. <laughs> so with Airbnb, it takes advantage of the fact that there's excess resources. And with the internet, it makes it very easy to connect someone who needs that resource and is willing to pay. And so Airbnb now is in over, like, actually, 200 countries and over 15 nights booked. And I've personally spent a lot of money on Airbnb. My accountant just looked at my accounts from last year, and she said, what is this Airbnb thing? <laughs> now, talking about cars, there's also a service now called Relay Rides. And one of my friends is an investor in Relay Rides. And so you have your car sitting in the parking lot. You can register for Relay Rides. People can find <laughs> it, rent it, and your car can make money. And the whole business has to cover all the issues, so they also cover all the insurance issues, they cover all the, so you don't have to worry about your car getting damaged or people stealing it. So your car could be making money. <laughs> yeah, but just think that money that you get from strangers driving it could fund your business for another six months. <laughs> so, okay, crowdsourcing, you guys, this is like, crowdsourcing is like huge, but y we primarily, um, th that, you know, in this world, we th we're all running out of time. Time's the most valuable thing. So how do you crowdsource? How do you use other people's time and effort and brains? The most, uh, one of the ones that has become really popular and um, sometimes people don't realize that it's actually crowdsourcing, is having the crowd evaluate. So eBay, they have an evaluation system for buyers and sellers. So what happened is the crowd, the community, the buyers rate each other, the sellers rate each other, so everyone has a rating. And then we choose to make a transaction based on that seller has a 99.9% .9 positive rating. Okay, or I'm not going to sell to that person because their rating is only 70%, which means like a third of the time they don't pay. So people choose to make transactions that way. And as a result, eBay no longer had to do an escrow service. When eBay first started, they had a service where the money was sent, they held on to it until the product was received and everyone said, okay, then they sent it. That was very expensive for eBay to keep the money and the deal with transactions and settlements, right? But once they put in this evaluation system, people felt safe enough to send money directly and receive it directly. And then eBay didn't have to, op to operate this escrow service, which was a huge cost. So they decreased the costs in that profit equation to make increase profitability by letting the crowd do the work. Um, user-generated content, we all know. I'm sure everyone's been on a site which has had user-generated content in the last few days. Now, you can actually crowdsource brain power, okay? This presentation I originally was asked to do for the EU in Brussels last July. And what happened was I did do a business model, develop a presentation on business models. And it was 4th of July, and I really didn't want to work because it's a big holiday in the U.S. with a lot of fireworks and beer. And so I posted on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn, hey, I'm working on this presentation on business models. Can you guys tell me what you think are great business models? I got like over 30 suggestions for this presentation. So I let all my friends write this presentation while I was drinking beer and watching fireworks. 
So, do you see? You can really get a lot of people to help you think, and it's n- and they're actually excited. Like what Shobit said to y- you guys this morning, you know, don't just try and sell to people. Ask them for their opinion. Ask them for their feedback, and they really feel a lot of times honored or valued that you're asking for their opinion. Fold it's a really cool science app about folding DNA, and it's something that can't be done by machine learning. It has to be done iteratively, and so they, this company Fold it, was just trying to solve the problem, made a game, and put it on the internet. And now, most of the kids in high school in science classes in the U.S. play Fold it for a few, for a few minutes a week as part of them understanding DNA. So they got the crowd to work on their problem, and then there's of course crowdfunding. This is a really cool uh, device um, built at MIT, which monitors certain elements of your body, and it can predict an epileptic seizure. Okay, and they put it on Indiegogo, and in three months they got funded seven hundred and eighty-two thousand dollars. So crowdfunding is a really good option for a lot of devices and new products. The only caveat that I want to say is, is there's so much on crowdfunding that if you use crowdfunding, it has to be accompanied with a really good marketing campaign. Okay, you can't just throw something on crowdfunding and expect it to come. You're going to have to associate it with a lot of. You know, marketing seminars, social media, yes, and Twitter. So, by the end of this week, I want to see all of you with a Twitter account. Okay, and then here's one last um, new business model that I want to cover because this is really the hot one in today's world because everything has sensors, and with sensors, you're collecting data, and so there's so much data now. And what a lot of the most successful companies recently, their business model has been to monetize data. Blue Kai is a company、um, where the founder was a master student at Stanford. What he did was develop a solution to go and scrub data from the internet to measure trends, measure activities, and they packaged it and sold it to marketers to help. People understand the marketing companies understand trends and how to sell products. Blue Kai made like three hundred million dollars within five years, simply going out there and collecting free data and packaging it. And they just got bought by Oracle、um, l- last year for a huge undisclosed sum. How they quantify it? Yeah, because it's it's very difficult when you're making a business model to quantify this this part. You know, the monetizing data. It's a it's, it's super difficult for me. How do you monetize do it? You know what? I don't have the exact thing, but I think they quantify it a lot based on traditional marketing models. You know, like、uh, mm, if if I sell, if Blue Kai sells the data to X Y Z and they use it. Then X Y Z gets that much more traffic or that much more revenue.、So、they can put yeah, <laughs> yeah, they have to associate it with some metric.、S- um, here's another example. Blue Kangaroo is a shopping app. So you have it on your your phone, and it'll send you discounts to your favorite brands that you list. If you walk by your favorite store like H and M and Lights Blind, it goes beep 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 beep. Walk in, walk in. You get twenty percent off right now if you show your coupon. So it's one of the you know very popular shopping apps, and it helps makes recommendations based on deals or merchants or location. But the interesting thing about Blue Kangaroo is that its business model is not the traditional referral fee or revenue share. Most shopping apps they make money by driving people to a store or. Um, helping the people to buy, and they get a revenue share. Those are the traditional shopping app business models. Well, what Blue Kai has done is this: they're collecting data about their users. They've got five million users. They go in the app and they go and do different things. They track the behavior of the users. They package it and actually give it to Blue Kai and Oracle to sell, <laughs> because Blue Kai and Oracle know how to sell it. 
So they're using the monetizing data model. And the cool thing is instead of selling it themselves, because their business is to build a great app, collect data, they don't know how to sell or they don't have the relationships. So then, then they partner with Blue Kai at Oracle to sell the data to the customers they already have. So it's a multi-level whole business model thing, is this they monetized data and they partnered with the right people to sell. So Google. Uh, has anyone ever paid for a Google service? Oh, what did you guys pay for? Oh, your cloud services. Yeah. So you guys are in the minority because most people here, how many people use Google service? OK. <laughs> how many people don't pay for their Google services? Guess what? You're paying for them. <laughs> Nothing's free, OK? They're, every time you use their service, they're collecting your data. They're collecting some information about you. And they're taking that information, and they're selling it. And that's how they're making $66 billion, OK? So this whole data thing is huge. And selling data is not a new concept. Like, you go to a grocery store, they scan your products. So when Safeway puts these scanners in in the 1980s, it was a cost center. It was a way to measure inventory and keep track of stuff. So it was on the cost side of the equation. But then Safeway realized, we're scanning this and collecting all this valuable data on what people buy. And like if they buy milk, they buy Oreo cookies, right? And trends. So they started selling that data that they were collecting with the scanners. So the scanners actually, instead of being a cost center, they became a revenue center. That is one of the coolest things that anyone can do in a business, is take something that was originally a cost and make it into a revenue. So now they've got iPad apps and phone apps, and they're selling, sending you coupons and collecting more data and making money. Okay. Um, Skin Vision is a Dutch company. It's funded by a Dutch VC, and there it's an app to help you look at some of your skin things and try and decide, is it dangerous? Do I need to go to the doctor? And now they've accumulated the largest melanoma database in the world, pictures and pictures of people's melanoma. And now they're licensing it to healthcare providers around the world. So what they started out with a service is become uh, monetizing data. And one quick thing for you guys as you're working on it, we hear the word license, license, okay? And license has several meanings. So I just want to clarify the two big licensings. Is one way is when you license technology, okay? In the example, Bell Labs has developed a technology for holographic storage. They license it to this company called Aconia. So Aconia pays like a yearly license. And then Aconia is a startup which is building holographic storage products to sell to the market. So this is licensing technology. For some of you who have some technology, uh, the liver cells, right? You know, this is one of the options for a business model. But then, the other place where license is used is especially with software and content. So Norton has an anti-spire software. You buy a license to use Norton, right? And that license can be a yearly or multi-yearly. And this provides recurring revenue. So in this case, the license is a product. And in this case, the license is the right to use a technology. So just make sure when you talk about licenses that you're clear which type of licensing you're talking about. And then my very last example is talking about creativity. How many of you would love to be paid to play instead of paid to work? <laughs> yeah, but your job is play. It's what you love to do, right? So do you see this picture? This is my son. That's me. That's my son with his customer. He's an engineering intern. He works really hard. He builds pieces and all these you know, engineering tools for his customers. And he works 
seven till seven, 12 hours a day, and he makes 1,800 a month, right? Oh yeah, I'm very proud of him. He comes home and he goes, Patrick, that's my son's cousin. He goes, Patrick, he dropped out of college, he quit his job selling men's suits, and he plays games all day long. You want to hear something? He's like, my son told me, Mom, do you know Patrick is making $2,000 a month playing games? Like, can you believe that? Do you believe that? It's pretty crazy, huh? Like, all the things we told our kids not to do, my son is like, Mom, you really hurt me when you canceled my World of Warcraft account. I could be making more money. Like, so the world's changing. The business model for this is there's a company called Twitch. There was a another company called Justin TV, and they provided streaming video services, okay? And Justin TV was not making money. They just couldn't come up with a business model for their free streaming video. So the CEO of Justin TV brought his vice presidents into the room and said, you guys, we got to do something or we're going to close the doors. So he said, you guys, you guys each take our technology and come up with a business idea and develop it. One of the VPs at Justin TV came up with the idea of Twitch. Let's take our streaming technology and create a service where gamers can broadcast when they're playing. Because a lot of people like to play and they want to watch the best gamers play so they know how to get to the next level in World of Warcraft or how to knock down the castle in Minecraft or something. So he built Twitch and some of these gamers, the best gamers, I went online, there'll be 20,000 people watching the best gamer play. Crazy, huh? And so Twitch then sells advertising right here. They have advertising around that. And they have this captured audience of 20,000 that they can show the advertising to. And then Twitch, in order to get the best gamers to go play on Twitch so they can sell advertising, Twitch shares the revenue from advertising with the gamers. And then another way Twitch allows the gamers to make money is there's a chat box here. And so my nephew goes, hey, dude, you're watching me for free. You should pay for it. Here's my PayPal account. And so he gets like $500 of donations of people watching him play Dune because he's very good at it. So isn't that crazy? So Twitch was acquired by Amazon for $970 million of cash last year. Cash. <laughs> and Google offered $1.4 billion, but it was in stock. And the Twitch founders wanted cash to go run off. So, what this shows is the moral of the story is business models change with time. And the second moral of the story is the kids really learn how to monetize what their parents tell them not to. So if you look at Bill Gates, his dad said, stay at Harvard. No, dad, I'm not. Then guess what? Bill Gates' dad ended up working for Bill Gates. <laughs> So, models are changing, the people who are younger people really know what's going on, so sometimes there are some of the best ideas for business models. So I really hope this presentation was to make you think of like, you know, some basic concepts about developing business models, who is the customer, where is the money, make it easy to collect money, okay, but also make you think about how People over history have observed the trends, taken advantage of that to make money. So see what's happening in your market, in you know, your, your area, it, with your customers, or maybe customers you didn't think of, and think of new ways for a business model. And things will change, but start with this concept, build a business model, and if it doesn't work, you can iterate and do it again till you hit the right person or the right market that will help you guys be super profitable. So, any questions? No? <laughs> okay, great. Well then, uh, let's kind of wrap up for like a few minutes and we can talk some more in the mentoring sessions and let's have a five minute break and then we'll go and talk about leadership and team. All right, thanks. <laughs> Oh.
Oh, well, one quick thing, guys. Um, um, after this, um, uh, after this main slide, I get put in a whole bunch of reference slides for you oh, yeah. on new con other concepts. You know, basics. One really big basic concept is the margin, okay? Which is, which is the um, the gross profit over sales. So it's basically um, revenue minus costs divided by sales price is the gross margin. And what happens in industry is, depending on your industry, there are some real standard margins, okay? And and what happens is. If you enter your industry and you have a really high margin, competition will force you to the standard. So this, these are some standards for margins. To give you an idea, a grocery store, the margin is 1% to 2% profit. And the reason they can survive on such a low profit is because they have so much volume. Okay? So, so if you go here, from here on, this, the presentation is in the Dropbox or the Google Drive, and there's just a bunch of different concepts that you guys can look at to think about when you are developing your business model. All right.